Krakow is Poland's most abundant city in historical, architectural, and artistic monuments and won the title Cultural Capital of Europe in 2000. Every month of the year, there are some festivals or other artistic events. In the city, which is part of the UNESCO World Heritage, the number of monuments adds up to 6,000. It has 40 museums and several institutions of higher education. Krakow was a capital and royal seat for 500 years and it's still the center of scientific and artistic life in the country. The city, which has 800,000 residents, is visited by six times this many tourists every year and the number of admirers of the castle district and the medieval core of the city that has remained untouched is growing continuously. The unique atmosphere of Wawel, similarly to the Hrajik in Prague or the castle of Budapest, represents the whole history of the country. The 25-meter-high hill rising above the Vistula River was framed by castle walls that gave protection to the palace and the cathedral. People lived on the land protruding from the swampy area even 1,000 years ago, and they called themselves Vistulans after the river. The first churches were built here in the 10th century when the Pius dynasty established a bishopric. Later, rulers urged vassals to take on Christianity. They created the basics of a strong Polish state. United civil service was implemented in the whole country and extended their power to the neighboring territories as well. Mieszko was followed by his son, Bolesław I of Poland, then his grandson, Mieszko II. They reigned as monarchs. The first king was crowned in 1320. Ladislas Lokitek was already crowned in the Cathedral of Wawel, which had been finished by then. The royal palace was built two centuries later. Due to conflicts with the Holy Roman Empire, Boleslav started fortifying the area. The planking was replaced by a high stone wall by the 15th century, in which towers and bastions were built. These not only served as accommodation for the guard, but there was a prison also. The heyday of the castle district was in the 16th century. Sigismund the Old made Valva one of the most luxurious and most beautiful royal residencies of Europe. The Renaissance-style buildings praised the work of Hungarian and Italian masters, who also worked on the castle of Buda. The marble mined in the Carpathian Mountains served as the basic material. Valva was a royal seat until the 17th century. After that, Warsaw took over this rule. The palace was occupied by the Austrians in 1846 when they used it as barracks. Its restoration started in 1905. In 1939, the Nazi German troops moved the seat of the governor and the city headquarters to here. Most of the art treasures could be successfully saved and transported to Canada from the looting of the Nazis. 
Moreover, the Polish managed to prevent the palace from being bombed, so less damage occurred to Krakow in World War II than to Warsaw. Three bastions are connected to the castle walls. The chicken leg, which got its name after its Y shape, the Sigismund Bastion, and the Sobieski Tower. These fortifications, built mostly of red brick, surround the royal palace, with which they were built at the same time. The upper parts of the palace, similarly to the bastions, were conceived in Renaissance style. The arched windows and doors of the ground floor and the vaults show signs of the Gothic period. In the inner courtyard of the castle, memorial plaques commemorate the local patrons of the renovation. It's worth seeing the equestrian statue of the Polish freedom fighter, Kosciusz Tare, which was destroyed by the Germans, but later restored in Germany according to the original plans, and was erected again here as a gift to the city of Dresden. The Gothic Cathedral was built on the grounds of two former Roman time buildings. Of these, only a crypt has remained in its place, which can still be seen today, and the bottom stone part of the Tower of Silver Bells. The different towers of the three-nave basilica, framed by a row of chapels, give the impression of a strange, but still harmonic image. The bell tower was finished in red brick, thus it creates a neo-Roman impression, while the clock tower is in Baroque style. The bell, which had been cast by King Sigismund, is the biggest in the country. Many legends are connected with it. It sounded only at ceremonial occasions. It last sounded at the death of Pope John Paul II. The most famous part of the cathedral is the Sigismund Chapel, covered by a golden cupola, which is one of the best pieces of Central European Renaissance. The two sides of the entrance are guarded by Archangel Michael and Saint Margaret. The origins of the mammoth bones hanging on the left side of the gate are unclear, but superstition has held up for centuries that the church will stand only as long as these bones hang on the gate. The main nave is separated by a pilaster, fortified by supporting pillars from the side naves. The interior and the row of chapels of the basilica offer an endless number of attractions. The tombs of several rulers were placed in the chapels and crypts. Here is where Ladislas Lokitek is buried, together with Ladislas Jagello, Casimir the Great, Sigismund the Old, and Istvan Bathory. Several aristocrats and artists, Adam Miskiewicz for instance, found a final resting place here, just like some former bishops of Krakow. Most of the visitors go on pilgrimages here to the romantic white marble sepulchre of Jadwiga Anshu. She was canonized in 1997. The royal palace is not very large, but it's a very well-proportioned, beautiful building. Originally, it was built in Roman style. In the time of Casimir the Great, it was enriched with Gothic elements, and later in the 16th century, it got its present Renaissance form. On the gate, there's a Latin sign, if God is with us, who is against us? The court contains characteristic elements of Italian architecture. The arcade galleries running on top of each other could be the scenery for Romeo and Juliet. The palace is the masterpiece of Francesco Fiorentino. The ceremonial court is a well-composed area which gives a magnificent impression. Mostly the pillared, arched bottom two floors of the wings of the building, arranged in a horseshoe shape, picture the sober orderliness and the mature regularity of the Renaissance. This is loosened by the magnificent pillars of the third floor holding up the roof, reaching to the sky. In a fascinating way, ornaments made of medallions and strings of flowers emerge behind them, running along like friezes. In the court of the palace, nightly tournaments, weddings and other ceremonies were held. This is where Isabella and Janusz Sapoyai took their wedding vows. For 16 years, Balint Bokfark, the king of lute music, lived and worked at this court. In the old royal halls of the palace, today exhibitions await visitors. Here, the original frescoes of the ceiling remained undamaged, together with some pieces of furniture. The tapestries made for Sigismund Augustus are especially beautiful. In the treasury of Wawel, Beautiful pieces preserved by Polish rulers are exhibited. Besides the regalia, we can see swords, ornaments, jewelry, and the robes of some kings. The richly ornamented royal accoutrements and some thrones have also remained. 
The collection is very rich, despite the fact that the jewelry collection of Sigismund Augustus, representing a great value, was lost soon after it was transported to Warsaw. The treasures that were transported to Canada from the war were shipped back in 1959. Then, several Polish aristocrats living abroad offered or donated their inestimable treasures to the museum. Still today, the curators of the museum try to retrieve all treasures that they think should be placed here by means of purchase and participating in auctions. The armory displays almost a complete range of the weapons of the Middle Ages. Next to the rotunda, an exhibition has been devoted to the architecture of Wawel, made more colorful with drawings and models. Here we can review the changes that occurred in the group of buildings between the 13th and the 18th centuries. Two interesting legends are connected to the castle. Buddhist believers think in the northwest corner of the court, one of the seven stones can be found that Shiva gave to the people, which charges those who meditate next to it with energy. The other is about a dragon. The beast lived in a cave under the castle hill of Krakow, and when it could not find sheep or cows, also ate people. Then the ruler had had enough of his people being killed. He had an artificial cow made filled up with sulfur, which caused the death of the greedy beast. Only after the death of the dragon could they start building on the castle hill. The winding staircase of the Bastion of Thieves leads down to the cave of the dragon, and at the entrance of the cave, we can meet the fire-breathing monster, fortunately only in the form of a statue. Especially the children, receptive to such tales, like to stand around the statue. But we should not be absolutely certain that the tale did not have any realistic basis. The archaeologists have found dinosaur bones in the cave that have remained in surprisingly good condition. The bank of the Vistula, especially in fair weather, is a favorite walking place of the residents of Krakow. Just like the bank of the river, the streets of the downtown area also recall the happy, peaceful times to our minds. Wherever we walk, sooner or later, the marketplace, Rynik Glovny, with its inimitable atmosphere, will open up in front of us. Its size is impressive. In Europe, only the St. Mark's Square in Venice and St. Peter's Square in the Vatican are larger. The square, which was developed in the Middle Ages, seems to be even more spacious than its area of 200 by 200 meters. The church towers expanded optically. Salt merchants, fish traders, vegetable and flower sellers and butchers offered their products here once, while the hall standing in the middle of the square served the traders of fabric and felt. Like medieval cities in general, Greenick Glovny was not only a commercial center, on the square, celebrations and executions were held, but also meetings, elections, and protests. This is where the Polish kings accepted the admiration of the residents of the city. On all sides of the squares, three streets open, respectively. These define the orderly system of streets on the downtown still valid today. The arched Gothic Hall of the Cloth Merchants is similar to an Oriental Bazaar today. Sellers of decorations and spices, gifts, devotional products, and postcard sellers are all lined up here. In the Great Hall upstairs, balls are held, and a gallery of Polish painters can also be found here. The original building was destroyed in a fire. The Renaissance Hall that is still standing today was built in 1556. The human heads carved of stone in the 100-meter-long row of arcades were made by Jan Mateko. A wide staircase leads upstairs. Under the arcades, memorial plaques and coats of arms of Polish cities can be seen. On the east side of the cloth hall stands the low St. Adalbert's Church with its green cupola, where a little wooden church once served as a place of worship. In this, according to tradition, the name-giver himself preached also, who reached Poland from Hungary, from the court of King St. Laszlo. The wooden church was replaced by a Roman-style stone building in the 11th century, which was part of the fortification of the city as well. The unmatched red-brick-towered St. Mary's Church is the most important ecclesiastical building of the city. Its full name is the Church of the Ascension of the Virgin Mary. 
its 69-meter smaller tower is a bell tower, and the taller 81-meter tower is a lookout tower. At the time of the Mongolian invasion, both of them played important roles. According to tradition, the towers were built by two brothers, and the younger stabbed the older brother to prevent him from building a higher tower than he. The murderous dagger can still be seen on the wall under the arcades. On the wall of the church, a memorial plaque was placed in honor of the much-respected Pope John Paul II, who in his young age served the church here under the name of Karl Wojtyla. The winged altar of Master Vitzvos, according to many, is the most beautiful carved altar in the world. The Hungarian poet Janos Pilinski wrote the following about it. The symbol touches the heart, the gate of heaven, the gate of paradise lost, opens up in the squeaking noises of reality. For a moment, what we have lost is present, and we have to find it again. The 11 by 13 meter artwork was under construction for 12 years and commemorates events from the life of Jesus. The lead-framed windows of the shrine were made by a local master in the 14th century. The little St. Anthony Chapel opens from the main nave. Once, it served as a kind of death row. From here, they took sinners to the marketplace to be executed. The medieval houses and intimate little streets surrounding the main square are abundant in attractions. Here stand the buildings of Collegium Maios and the Collegium Novum. Jagello University is the oldest university of Central Europe. Its museum was set up in the building of the Academy of Fine Arts. Henry III once lived in the building named Grey House, then Coschiuso Tare. On the wall of the Montelupi House, a memorial plaque announces that this is where the Italian family lived who started the first postal service. The Russian false Dmitri held his wedding with the daughter of a Polish voivode in the Boner House in 1605. The Club of Atheists is in operation in the Golden Head House. The Virzinek House is famous for its restaurant that has been open for a century, and also for the fact that this is where the Polish king, Casimir the Great, the Czech king, Karl IV, Hungarian king, Louis I, and Danish king, Valdemar, met. The Gucci House was the home of Italian architect and sculptor Santi in the 15th century, whose descendant is the world-famous fashion designer. The lone tower of the old city hall reaches to the sky, the building that used to stand next to it was demolished in the 15th century. Today, the City Historical Museum can be found here. In the basement of the Christopher Palace, created by putting together three medieval houses, the scientist of the Middle Ages, the alchemist Twardowski, did his experiments. His adventurous story is known by everybody in Poland. In the souvenir shops, small Twardowski statuettes, riding on a crescent moon, are still popular gifts. The ancient streets of Stare Miesto have an especially good atmosphere after sunset. North of the main square, we can find the most interesting remaining sections of the old wall which once surrounded the city. While walking around in Krakow, sooner or later, we will surely meet with the characteristic ring-shaped pretzels. In the old town, we can still find some cafes that are reminiscent of the monarchy, which peacefully coexist with the internet cafes of the 21st century. Otherwise, Poland is traditionally more of a tea-drinking than a coffee-drinking nation. So we can't find a catering institution in the country where we can't drink herbatka. The name of the Florian Gate was given by the patron saint of the city. This is where the King's Road to Wawel started. Many rulers entered the castle through the gate built in 1307. Eight gates divided the city wall once, each of them equipped with a drawbridge. These were protected partly by the city guard and partly by the guilds who had little shops and workshops attached to the wall. All of the guilds had a section of the wall appointed to them. 
the 24-meter diameter, thick-walled Barbican made of red brick was built as protection against the Turkish. Karoy Wojtyla, Archbishop of Krakow, who advanced to St. Peter's throne in the autumn of 1978 under the name John Paul II, lived in the Archbishop's palace opposite to the Franciscan Church. He was not only the first Polish pope, but after almost 500 years, he was the first ecclesiarch who was not born in Italy. During his time as pope, he visited Poland six times, and at these times, he always stayed in the Archbishop's palace. Karol Wojtyla was born in 1920 in Wadowice. He became a priest at the age of 26. He got his doctorate in theology at the Krakow University. Besides philosophical and theological works, he also wrote dramas and short stories. Among enlightened people, he received great respect when he admitted the sins of the Catholic Church as Pope and apologized for the Crusades and the violent spread of the Catholic faith, for showing an anti-science attitude in the past and for the atrocities of the Inquisition. John Paul II is worthy of the pride of his countrymen. Europe can boast three large salt mines that have been developed into tourist attractions. Hallstatt in Austria, Parajd in Transylvania, and Wielitzka in Poland have become part of UNESCO's World Heritage. The salt region developed here approximately 20 million years ago when the water of the sea evaporated and the enormous quantity of salt left here hardened into stone. In the beginning, salt was dissolved in water and used for preserving food and animal skins. The more productive mass mining was started about 700 years ago by Hungarian miners. The daughter of Hungarian King Béla IV was only 15 years old when she married Polish King Boleslav. The match, made out of political considerations, turned out to be such a success that the couple lived together happily for 40 years. After the death of her husband, Kinga did not undertake to rule the country, and until her death, she lived in the nunnery of Oskendetz as an abbess. The work of the miners who came to her calling meant continuous profit for Krakow, since salt was one of the most important export products in the Middle Ages. In Vialitska, up to this day, salt has been mined, although not in industrial quantities. The visit in the mine starts with wooden stairs leading down to a depth of 300 meters, and it seems there's never an end to it. In the cavities that were created in the process of mining, some statues have been carved out of salt boulders, which provide a magnificent spectacle when they're lit. In the first hall, we can see the statue of Copernicus, the great astronomer. The statues of the Janovca chamber depict the well-known legend. Bela IV donated the salt mine to Mara Maros to his daughter Kinga. As a sign of taking possession, the princess threw her ring in one of the shafts. In one of the blocks of the Vialitska salt mine, this ring was found. The group of statues depicts the finding of the ring. About 1,000 miners worked here, using manual labor, pickaxes, and mining hammers. The mined blocks were not transported in the tunnels by bogies, but by cars pulled by mine horses. The horses, which worked for years in almost complete darkness, became blind and could never enjoy their retirement years. They were saved from these sufferings only by industrialization in the 20th century. In one of the rooms, a real surprise awaits visitors. A minor orchestra dressed in gala uniforms gives a concert. The salt carving of the room of Casimir the Great depicts the king who first put the rights of miners into writing. In two other rooms, the Shielets and the Pieskowska Scala the tools and transportation equipment of mining are exhibited. Their use is demonstrated with the help of audiovisual tools. The road leads along crystal caves and mine lakes. In the caves, stone dwarves wield the tools of the mining trade. The mine consists of nine levels and the three-kilometer section walked by the tourists is only 3% of the channels. The 
full length of the mine is 250 kilometers and it contains 2,000 shafts in all. The Holy Cross Chapel is one of the few places decorated with statues carved of wood. The 55 meter long and 12 meter high statues and reliefs of the Kinga Chapel were carved out of salt blocks of about 20,000 tons in weight. The reliefs on the walls represent scenes from the life of Jesus, including a relief of the Last Supper. Naturally, John Paul II, who canonized Kinga, is commemorated by a statue here also. The side of the giant hall lit by crystal chandeliers presents the visitors of Vialitska with a memorable experience. In Vialitska, the miners and mining engineers who worked here once are commemorated in several places. They named a separate room after Josef Pelsudski. In the Weimar Room, a light and sound show is presented. This is where the life-size statue of Goethe stands. The music is compiled of the works of Wagner. The National Park of Oizo is worth visiting, especially for those who spend at least a week in Krakow. The park is only 20 kilometers from the city, where castles, caves, and river valleys framed by hills and forests are waiting to be discovered. Oizo is the favorite weekend excursion place of the residents of Krakow. So tourists make a better choice if they visit here during the week. The grill bars and snack bars along the road, which provide the atmosphere of a picnic, are all open at this time also. The 21 square kilometer national park is easily accessible by bus. Since Poland is traditionally a religious, Catholic country, we can also find places of worship in parks too. This, however, is not a stone church, but a nicely carved little wooden chapel opposite the car park. This is the starting point of hikes. From here, motor vehicle traffic is not allowed, but we can use an environmentally friendly horse cart. The horse taxi takes us along a whole row of weekend houses to the ruins of the castle of Oizo from the 14th century. Many Krakow residents have weekend houses or lots here where many grow vegetables and fruit as a hobby. The making of sauerkraut has a long tradition. The cabbage grown in the garden is pickled in barrels or nowadays in clay pots and used in the making of bigos. The Polish national food inspired the following lines by Mickiewicz in the Pan Tadeusz. Bigos was on the boil, hard to express in words the wondrous taste the hue and gusty aroma of the huntman's stew. Words are clanging symbols, rhymes but serried sounds. Their substance, the townsman's belly will never plumb. To savor Litva's songs and victuals, one needs robust health, country life, 
and the thrill of the hunt. Yet even without such seasonings, Migos is no ordinary dish. It's skillfully prepared of the finest vegetables. Choucroutes, the base of it, fine and tart a la Polonaise, so toothy, as the saying goes, it makes its own way to your lips. Locked within a boiler, it simmers and broods over the choicest morsels of game meat until every ounce of living essence is coaxed out, till the steam spouts from the vessel's rim and the ambient air becomes steeped with its exquisite odors. The Polish like nature, excursions, picnics, and outdoor cooking and roasting. In the area of the park, besides the castles, some remaining old villas can also be visited. Of the once impressive buildings of the castle of Oitzov, only the pentagonal tower and the gate have remained. Nearby, there are two museums that we may visit. The local history museum exhibits the regional history, ethnography, and traditions, while the national park exhibits its rich flora and fauna. In the park, or very close to it, we can find four caves to which tourist paths lead. Down there, all year round, refrigerator-like temperatures dominate, which means five to seven degrees Celsius. It's worth preparing for this with coats and sweaters. If we've had to leave our cars anyway, we can not only go on a good walking tour, but we can take the opportunity for a bicycle tour, even with a rented mountain bike. The scenic valley of the Prodnik is winding among the oldest ranges of the Jura of Krakow. The river valley, narrowing to canyons at some places, is framed with limestone rocks of various shapes. The valley widens at some places, here it's surrounded by green fields, while in the white rocks the mouths of caves of various sizes are open. The famous rock formation standing at the estuary is called the Krakow Gate. The log-shaped rock rising behind is called Hercules Club. In the last third of the 10 kilometer long valley, the view of the romantic castle standing on the steep hill opens up. The Piaskowska Skala was built in the 14th century to be a royal watch post, and then it became the possession of a Polish aristocratic family. It received its present form in the 16th century. Looking from the valley, its dream castle feature predominates. While walking up to it, the castle shows the image of a robust fortress. Its outer walls with watchtowers guard an impressive Baroque gate. Its courtyard is dressed in colorful flower pomp from the spring. In the building, a subdivision of the Wawel Museum of Krakow is in operation, exhibiting mostly Renaissance furniture, paintings, and handicrafts. In the courtyard, Classical music performances are held in the summer. An excursion in the fresh air is enjoyable in itself, but we may further enhance it with a meal in the excellent restaurant of the castle, as is often done by Polish families. The castle has a direct bus line to Krakow, so the beers that we drink after the meal won't cause any problems either. The intimacy of the arcade inner courtyard covered by archaic cobblestones is enhanced by Renaissance loggias and Italian-type graffito decorations. From the yard, terraces and windows of the Piaskowska Scala, a scenic view opens up. Don't leave your cameras at home. Moreover, a telescope might be useful also. Many animals live on the territory of the National Park of Oitsov. Those whose hobby is bird watching should not miss this by any means. Whether we spent the day with an excursion or sightseeing, in the evening, it's worth walking to the main square of Krakow. 
this time, life quickens. The Rini Glovni functions as a promenade then. Before dinner, we can have ourselves carried around the square by one of the several handsome cabs. The signs of the large square are girdled almost continually by restaurants with terraces. Although there are Italian, Arab, Greek, Chinese, and who knows what other kinds of restaurants, we have plenty of opportunities to try the traditional flavors of the Polish cuisine. Especially the Slavic countries had a large influence on the Polish cuisine. Borscht and shi soups, the use of sauerkraut and beetroot is as widespread as in Russia. Bigos is also made of sauerkraut with game meat and forest mushrooms. A long time ago, it was mostly made at the time of hunting. The Polish style vegetable dishes are baked in pans covered with pie crust and sour cream. Wild mushrooms are especially popular. A popular meat dish is the dish zrazu, in which a roasted beef or veal cutlet is braised with onions and mushrooms. Stuko miesa zapiekana is beef and vegetables served in a thick horseradish sauce. Good fish dishes are also extremely popular, especially trout. Of the pasta dishes, pirogi and blini are the leaders. Patski is a real specialty, a donut with rum and filled with rose jam. They eat an unusually large quantity of forest fruits, blueberries, and blackberries. The Polish are beer drinking people. With most of their food, beer goes better than wine. The lovers of refined flavors may try the beer seasoned with blueberry syrup. Of alcoholic drinks, vodka has unlimited popularity. In the one called Goldwasser, grains of gold are floating. Zubrovka is flavored with sweet grass. Although we can find the fast food chains that are known all around the world in Krakow too, believe us, it's better to try the local specialties. By the way, we may mention a few more activities in Krakow if somebody is longing for more than a simple dinner. To name a few, the classical music evenings at Wawel, the Beethoven Festival, the Organ Music Days, the Festival of Traditional Music, the Festival of Court Dances. Of all events, the most spectacular is the Vianki, held at the end of June, when they let wreaths with burning candles float on the water of the Visla. Whether we go by car, by bus, or by train, it takes less than half an hour to get from Krakow to Katowice. The city is the center of Upper Silesia. For a period of time, it belonged to the Czech Republic, then for 200 years to the Habsburg Empire, and it became part of Poland again in the 18th century. Basically, it's an industrial and mining city, the economic center of the administrative region with its sites concentrated in the downtown area. The main square and the pedestrian zone that opens from here play defining roles. We may sit around in the well-maintained parks of the city, most of which were developed in the last decade. The attraction of Rynek is the classicist city theater, the Vizbianski, built in 1907. The wooden churches made of larch or silver fir trees and the Silesian wooden houses are also famous. These, together with other works of folk architecture, can be seen in the Ethnological Museum in Katowice. We look for Auschwitz, the eternal symbol of cruelty and inhumanity on the map of Poland in vain. The settlement here is not called by its infamous German name, but by its Polish name, Oswiecim. The settlement became a city in the 13th century, but even before that, it was not very well known even in Poland. It wouldn't be visited by as many tourists today if the Nazi concentration camp had not been here between May 1940 and January 1945, which recorded the name of Auschwitz forever in world history.
On the main gate, we can see the sign familiar from so many films, Arbeit macht frei, that is, work sets us free. The Nazis tried to conceal the camp in Auschwitz and pretend that it was a forced labor camp. Towards the end of the war, it became clear that the prisoners died not only of the inhuman circumstances, but also because of the violent treatment. Only following the sentences of the tribunal, more than 20,000 people lost their lives. Among many other reasons, Oswitzim was suitable for the role of the concentration camp because it had a railroad junction where the victims could be transported in freight cars. The Germans rebuilt an old military barracks for their purposes. The large open area surrounding the camp made it easy to supervise the people and gave grounds for expansion. Two million people of different nationalities were eliminated here with unmatched cruelty. The Polish, Hungarian, Czech, Russian, Slovakian, Ukrainian, and victims of other nationalities are commemorated by exhibitions shown in separate barracks. We can also become acquainted with typical Nazi documentary films here. Nearly 90% of the victims were Jewish, but we should not forget that here they also deported anti-Nazis and agitators, regardless of nationality. The camp of Birkenau was also close, and across Poland, 40 such institutions functioned during World War II. In the visitor's center, a documentary film of the liberation of the camp is shown every half hour. Here, we can also find a bookshop where we can buy photo albums, CDs, and DVDs. A few thumps, a few claps, the swing of boots, the jab of gun points, some dim wails wrote Imre Kertes, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature for his novel, Fateless. Many other literary works and films have been made about the horrors of the concentration camps. First, the monumental film version of the novel War, written by the American writer Herman Wouk, was shot here at the original scene. And Roberto Benigni received an Oscar for his film, Life is Beautiful. In the exhibition set up in the barracks, the personal belongings of the prisoners the bunk beds of the dwelling areas, latrines, torture rooms, and offices of the guards may be seen. Human hair, glasses, dentures, artificial limbs, amalgam removed from teeth, cheap suitcases, identity card photos, letters, memories of children and old people starved to be skinny as a rail, shaved bald. Still in motion pictures with striking power, flashing lights, the clattering of the wheels of trains. Besides Polish and Israelis, many Germans also visit here. Young people and old who lived through World War II. Were they Nazis or quite the opposite? Were they brought here by their conscience? Do they want to remember? Or, at least subconsciously, to do penance? And what ideas are born in the swarms of tourists of various nationalities when they face the unimaginable? Do they play with the idea, as Robert Harris did in his book Führer, what would have happened if the Third Reich had won the war? And if it had been their turn? The concentration camp raises different thoughts in everybody, but nobody is left untouched. As the outcome of the war took a turn for the worse for the Germans, they started to increase the number of executions. 
Victims were directed into shower cabins, where not water, but gas came from the heads. The dead bodies were thrown on top of one another and carried on handcars into crematoria, where they were burnt. The designers of the exhibition did not use any dramatic devices here. There are no photos, no pathetic music. The bare walls and the still crematorium, still streaked with soot, are more suggestive than the best such displays. Krosno, a medieval merchant town, still preserves something of its ancient atmosphere. The wine trade road ran here, the most important product of which was Tokai wine that reached the table of the kings of Europe this way. The historic part of town lies south of the river, on a small hill. The excavations of the medieval town hall, as well as old residential houses, are still taking place on the marketplace. One of the wine cellars framing the square was of Istvan Dobo, the captain of Eger, the hero of the crescent moon of Eger. Balint Balashi, a relative of Dobo, poet of the border castles, escaped here when he was accused of high treason. The most significant site of Krosno is the 15th century Franciscan church, in the chapel of which the couple of the local Romeo and Juliet legend were buried. Several similar stories can be encountered all over the world. The one of Krosno is about two half-brothers and sisters, Anna and Stanislav, who, as being close relatives, needed papal permission for marriage, though by the time the boy arrived with the permission, the girl had died. Stanislav followed her into the grave in grief. The youngsters were, in fact, members of the Oswitzin family, medieval landlords of the later Auschwitz. The church clinging to the town wall was significantly rebuilt in the 19th century. Krosno was called Little Krakow in the Middle Ages due to its wealth and prosperous trade. Before the deluge, as the great Polish writer Sienkiewicz described the Swedish attack, Ferenc Rakoczy II, Prince of Transylvania, besieged the town. It was followed by centuries of decline, until oil found in the 19th century caused the industry of the town and its surroundings to flourish. Nowadays, Krosno is flirting with the idea of tourism, and in fact, not in vain. The other church of the town is in possession of the biggest bell in the country after the one in Krakow. The separate bell tower is 38 meters high. Krosno is the first step on the route to the Carpathian Sanctuaries, a well-known pilgrimage, which is part of the program for most tourists visiting Krakow. Tarno is the town of General Josef Bem. He traveled around half the world, lived in Hungary and in Turkey as well, yet he was buried here, where he was born. The mausoleum stands in Strezelitsky Park. The stone sarcophagus lying on six Corinthian pillars protrudes from an artificial pond covered by water lilies. As beautiful as it is, this solution was created by necessity. Bem, who fought in Turkey, then became the governor of Aleppo in Syria, became a believer in Islam, causing the Catholics to forbid his burial in Polish soil. Josef Bem was born in 1794. 
he completed the Military University of Technology in Warsaw. At the age of 18, he took part in Napoleon's expedition in Russia. He was an excellent strategist, genuine captain, and a brave soldier. After the capitulation at Vilagos, he became the governor of Aleppo as Pasha Murat. He predicted the outbreak of the Turkish-Russian War, but he didn't live to see it, dying in December 1850. On proposal of the Ben Memorial Board in Tarno, he was reburied in 1929. His silver coffin, ornamented with the Polish eagle, was carried home to his hometown from Istanbul to Krakow via Sofia, Belgrade, and Budapest. The birth house of the general, which is marked by a memorial plaque, stands on the corner of the marketplace in Tarnow. The High Tatra is the highest point of the Carpathian Mountains. The mountain area was declared a national park in the 1950s. Though the Tatra is beautiful in every season, especially winter skiing attracts tourists here. The tourist center of the area is Zakopane. Istvan Bathory gave village rights to the tiny mountain settlement in 1578. A long time passed before Zakopane became a holiday resort and a tourist and ski paradise by the end of the 19th century. By today, the number of its residents has reached 30,000. A Warsaw doctor, Holobinski, was the first to realize how beneficial the clear Tatra air is for tuberculosis and other pulmonary diseases. Due to his strenuous work, hotels, sanatoriums, and cottages were built on the mountainside. By the turn of the century, Zakopane had become the most popular holiday resort of the country. The pedestrian zone of the town, Krupovski, is abundant in shops, restaurants, folk taverns, and bars with terraces. Wheels of plain and smoked sheep cheese are sold in the streets everywhere, and these make good presents, too. We can taste almost all the delicacies of the Polish cuisine here, and of course drink some good Polish beer. Restaurants offer fresh trout, as caught in the mountain creeks. It would be a pity to miss it. Every service that can be important for tourists can be found here currency exchange and ATMs, travel agents where we can book accommodation, tourist information centers, and bookstores where we can buy maps, guidebooks, or photo albums, souvenir shops, post offices, phone and internet points, and a taxi station. We can also take a mountain guide, buy a ski pass, rent a bike, and find a doctor. However, it's not the only thing Kruposki is important for, but for its unique atmosphere as well. Spectators are entertained by street musicians and puppeteers. Coachmen provide their horses, and cheese, mushroom, pretzel, and balloon vendors offer their products. It's worth visiting the place any month of the year. In spring and in summer, the soft green grass of alpine fields is dotted by wildflowers. Tourist paths curve following the direction of mountain creeks. On the hillsides, little goral wooden houses withstand the siege of time. Sheep, cows and goats graze in the thick grass. Though the sky is bright blue, it's not warm up in the mountains. From the foot of grey cliffs protruding from the grass, we can look at little mountain villages hiding down in the valley. Autumn, with its yellowing foliage, is perfect for hiking weather on foot, bike, or on horseback. In winter, skiing is the highlight of the season. Of course, we can slide on snowboards or sledge, and powdery snow is ideal for throwing snowballs. Snowmen stand in the yards of guest houses and only the top of dark green pine trees stick out from under the snow cover. Smoke promising friendly warmth descends from chimneys and tourists tired of skiing are offered chestnuts and hot wine in the guest houses. An international ski championship was first held here in 1911 
In 1925, a ski jump was built. Then, in 1929, 1939, and 1962, world championships were held here. The town has undergone a significant infrastructural change since then, and today it's a healing, holiday, and sport paradise of high European standard, where not only Central European visitors come. The famous market can be found at the end of the street, where warm knitted jumpers, carvings, leather sandals, ornaments, and articles for personal use are sold. We can buy kitchen utensils, as well as wooden baskets for the sauna, or a carved picture. Leaving the market, we soon arrive at the terminal of the cogwheel train. It was built between the two world wars, but it has been renovated several times. The present trains were supplied by an Austrian company that operates in the Alps, too. From the windows of the cogwheel train, we can have a look at the graveyard of the Excellent, where the graves of many prominent people are, including Savala, an expert of Goro folklore, tales, and legends of the Tatra, Witkiewicz, a writer and painter from Krakow, and Josef Kseptowski, who helped a lot of people escape from the Germans through the border during World War II. In the Polish Tatra, the traditions of Goral, or Carpathian Slavic folk music, folk art, carving, and folk architecture, live on. Stanislaw Witkiewicz was the Krakow artist who created Zakopane's neo-Goral architectural style using local motifs at the beginning of the 20th century. Most of the houses on the mountainside represent this style, showing one opportunity for the renewal of traditions. Not so long ago, a summer bob field was built into the steep mountainside to attract cliff lovers even when there's no snow. At the peak of the Gubalovka mountain, at the upper terminal of the cogwheel train, a restaurant with terrace welcomes travelers with a beautiful panorama. If we look down, we can see the town, and with good binoculars, we can even make out the hustle and bustle of Krupkowski. From above, the ridge of the Givont Mountains looks down on us which, according to legend, is a sleeping giant who protects the town from every disaster if needed. The 175 square kilometer high Tatra, more precisely the mountain area of the Silesian Beskids, is perfect for hiking and mountain climbing. Wandering in the endless hills, lakes and mountains of Poland's beautiful towns, medieval castles, luxurious palaces, and rich museums, call out to tourists to linger a while. We can roam in the elegant streets of the old towns with bastions, among the coats of arms of fine patrician houses. We can also look around the countryside from high castle walls, admiring glorious cathedrals, and then enjoy a hike in the vast woods. We can get to know a very diverse country with friendly people and an ancient culture who gladly welcome visitors.